Well, good morning and happy Palm Sunday to all of you. We are so excited to be here together with you this morning. And you know, things are a little bit different these days and we can't necessarily get out and do the things that we want to do. And of course, we would love to have all of you guys here with us in the building this morning. Um, unfortunately, that's just not the case, but you know what? That's not gonna stop us from celebrating Palm Sunday and next week celebrating Easter Sunday. As Christians, the biggest thing that we celebrate is the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And we're not going to let the circumstances that we're going through right now prevent us from doing that. So we're going to be right here with you each and every Sunday morning until this season is over. So thank you so much for being with us. I hope that you'll find today's service both uh, enjoyable and uplifting, and I hope that you're enjoying some time at home with your family. So today is Palm Sunday, and a lot of people uh, have some questions about what Palm Sunday may be. So we're going to talk today about uh, Palm Sunday, what its significance was and Jesus triumphant return to Jerusalem. So as Brother Ken told us a little bit earlier on, Palm Sunday simply means the palm branches that were used. Um, when Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, which we're going to talk about here in just a few minutes, they laid their cloaks and they laid palm branches out for the donkey to walk across. They also fanned him with palm branches as well. So that's where we get kind of that significance of the palm as part of Palm Sunday. And then we have this week leading from Palm Sunday up to Easter Sunday. Now, we have some pretty cool things planned for you this week. We're going to have a scripture reading by one of our members that will go out each and every day of the week as we kind of build that momentum from today up until Easter Sunday. So keep an eye on your emails. It's going to be a great week for us, and we'll wrap that up next week with our Easter Sunday celebration as well. So let's go ahead and jump into the scripture, and let's just read and talk through Jesus's return to Jerusalem. So if you would, go ahead and open up your Bibles. And we are going to be talking about the return of Jesus all the way up and through when he cleansed the temple today. And then next week, we're going to talk a little bit about the crucifixion and, of course, the resurrection. So if you want to jump in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 21, again, that's Matthew chapter 21. We're going to read this together. So I want to encourage you to open your Bibles or your Bible app or wherever you like to read the scripture. And let's read this together as a church family. And we're going to dive into this a little bit deeper and talk through some of these key points. So let's get started. In Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 3, it reads, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at, at once you will find a donkey tied there. It says, With her colt by her. It says, Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. Now, this is a really cool piece of this, of this scripture because not only does it fulfill the prophecy of Jesus returning on the donkey, but, but here's the really cool thing about this. It says that he's just supposed to tell them that these donkeys are for the Lord and they're going to be okay with that. And as we read the scripture, that's exactly what happens. Now, there's some speculation here. Some people say, oh, well, this is something that was set up ahead of time. Or some people will say that it's because the, belief, that the people who owned the donkeys were believers in Jesus. So they were simply willing to do that. But either way, Jesus knew ahead of time exactly where to send his disciples to put this plan into motion. And that's something that we're going to look at today as we go through this. It's really cool the way that Jesus knew every step of the process and kind of walked the disciples through exactly what was going to happen. Because you see, he already knew, of course, what was going to happen. And he was putting this plan into place and keeping his disciples in the loop as we go through the story. So let's go ahead and continue. And we're going to pick up in 21, verse 4 and 5. It says, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. It says, say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And of course, that comes from Zechariah 9, 9, where we see, just like we have looked at the last couple of weeks, we see the prophecy of what's going to happen. And then we jump to the New Testament and we see that fulfillment of the prophecy. Now, it's significant that he chose to ride in on a donkey. A donkey was a beast of burden. A donkey was a servant. So that's very significant that that's what he chose to ride in on. Because see, in this time, when somebody would have made a triumphant entry into a city, they would have come with lots of pomp and circumstance, and they would have had this beautiful white stallion horse 
or something to that effect, and it would have been very majestic, and it would have been very regal when they came into the city. But see, Jesus didn't do that, because Jesus didn't come to rule as a king. He came as a servant. And that's why it's so significant that he chose a beast of burden, or in this case, a donkey, as opposed to choosing a horse, or whatever the case may be. So see, as we pick this apart and we look at every little piece, we're going to see this plan, this perfect plan that was put into place ahead of time as we go through the story. So let's, let's keep reading. Let's pick up in Matthew 21, verses 6 through 9. It says, The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road says, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Now, this is, this is really cool because this is the first time that we see Jesus acting like a king. Now, you have to remember, if you're familiar with the Gospels, that up until this point, when Jesus would heal someone, he didn't want them to tell them, who he was. He didn't want them to tell them that he was the Messiah. Even when Peter finally recognized that Jesus was the Messiah, he said, don't tell anybody that. So this is really cool because here we see Jesus is finally going to be the king that most people thought he was going to be. Now, we as Christians know that he is the Messiah, and we know that he's a different type of king, and we're going to talk about that. But up until this point, he's kind of worked behind the scenes, and oftentimes we read in the Gospels that when he would heal somebody, he would take them outside of the city, or he would take them to a different place. And then afterwards, he always instructed them, don't go back to the city, keep this to yourself. But that's all about to change. Now, we have to understand the reason it's about to change. And as we start to unpack this a little bit further, we'll understand the reason that it had to change because it's all part of this amazing plan that we're starting to see unfold one piece at a time. Now, when they talk about setting the cloaks and things down like that, we have to remember that at this time, they're preparing for the Passover feast and it's estimated there would have been about 2.5 million people in Jerusalem at this time because you see if you lived within 20 miles of Jerusalem you were expected to come to the Passover celebration and even outside of that 20 mile range the Jewish people would travel from very far distances to come to this place so it wasn't an accident that Jesus is making this entry during this time he's doing it because he knew the impact of this would be that there would be lots and lots of people there. Because see, if you back this story up just a little bit, we know that prior to his making his triumphal entry, he had been staying at the house of Mary and Martha. Now, that's significant because when we think about Mary and Martha, we think about Lazarus, right? We have to remember that just prior to this, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, that's obviously very, very significant, and that's a lot of what started to draw this buzz around Jesus. This is what really started to make people go, hey, we want to go see this guy, because what we don't see in this part of the scripture is prior to this triumphant entry, people had already started to come to the home of Mary and Martha to see Jesus and to see what this hype was all about. And that's why, as he starts moving towards Jerusalem, he already has this pack of people around him. Now, it's, it's interesting, you see in this scripture, it says the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed him. Now, it's thought to be that those people that went ahead of him were the people who were just wanting to see what this was all about and who this guy was. And the people that were following him were his disciples and his believers. Now, I think that's significant because that's exactly what we do, right? We are following Jesus just as the disciples did. So let's go ahead and continue with our scripture. We're going to pick up in verse 10 and 11. It says, When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. To put this plan into place, Jesus had to make a stir. He had to make an impact. Right, Because we know how this story is going to unfold. We know that eventually Jesus is going to be arrested and he's going to be placed on the cross. But in order to do that, he couldn't just slip into the city on a back road. He couldn't just kind of sneak into the city with his hood on his cloak up. He had to make an entrance. He had to get people stirred up. 
He had to get people knowing what was going on because he knew that that would anger the Roman leaders and would cause them to start to put this plan into place. So that's exactly what he does. He rides in on the donkey. He's dressed in his white clothing. He's got his disciples with him. He's creating a stir. And now we've got people shouting his name as he enters the city. So it's all falling into place. But that had to happen in order to start this process of what we're going to see throughout the story. So I want to take just a quick look at the timeline. This timeline is really, really important. See, we see Jesus enter Jerusalem on Sunday. Now, on Monday is when we know the story of him causing the fig tree to wither, and he cleared out the temple courts. Now, that, that's kind of significant because if you just read through the book of Matthew, it looks like he cleared the temple courts right after he came in with his triumphant return. But we know that when we dig a little bit deeper and we look at some of the other Gospels, that's actually not the case. It was actually the next day that he did that. And that's important that we know that this didn't all happen on the same day. So we see that on Tuesday is when the authorities started to question him and he teaches in the temple. Now, He's doing this for two reasons. He's teaching because he wants to continue to do his father's work right up until his last days, but he's also teaching because he knows that this is going to anger the Roman authorities and it's going to cause them to come after him and try to arrest him. On Wednesday, we see that Jesus' enemies plan the plot against him. This is where we see this whole thing starting to get into place and we start learning about that Judas is going to betray him and what the price would be. On Thursday, we see Jesus shares the Lord's Supper with his disciples and prays at Gethsemane. Now, this is what Brother Ken was talking to us about a little bit earlier on, is this is when Jesus actually took the Last Supper. And that is so significant to us because we carry on that tradition of taking that Last Supper every single Sunday because it's the example that Jesus set for us. And because that's our way of saying each and every Sunday That yes, Jesus, we believe that you are the son of the living God and that you came to earth and lived as a man and died for our sins. We're saying that, we're proclaiming that every single Sunday. So it's important that we understand the Lord's Supper and what it means and that we continue to do that. And I just love that on the night of his betrayal, he put this plan into place. Now on Friday, it says Jesus is betrayed. He's arrested, he's tried, he's crucified and buried. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that next week when we get into our Easter lesson. And then we know Saturday he's in the tomb, and on the next day he's risen from the dead. But I just want you to kind of understand what this timeline of his final week kind of looks like, because it's important. Now, we know that that before the Passover even started, he was already in the area, so to speak, because he was with Mary and Martha, with Mary and Martha, and stayed at their house. And then we know that he made that triumphant entry, and then he cleaned out the temple courts. So let's take a look and see what that looks like as well. In Matthew chapter twenty-one, verses twelve and thirteen, it says Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers, and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Now, I love this story. And this is, to be honest with you, a story that I get as many questions about from non-believers as I do believers. And they say, well, if we're not, if as Christians, we're not supposed to be angry. Why is Jesus flipping over tables in the temple courts? So this is something that we call righteous anger. Okay, Jesus was upset because they had taken his father's house and they had turned it into a greedy, lying, sinful den of people trying to take advantage of other people. And it made him angry. And it's this thing called righteous anger. It's not getting upset over nothing. It's not flying off the handle over nothing. But what that means is sometimes we get upset about things we should be upset about. When we see Christians being persecuted, we should be upset about that. When we see people who are mistreating children, we should be upset about that. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. But I love the fact that this is Jesus being human. He's got emotions just like you and me. He gets upset about things. When he saw what was going on in the temple, he got upset about it and he did something about it. And that's what I love about this portion of scripture and that's why I wanted to leave this in even though it's technically the day after his triumphant entry is 
It's just Jesus being the Son of God and standing up for his Father and saying, hey, it's not okay for you to defile your relationship with God. And he does something about it. And I just love that. I love that human side of Jesus. Now, if we pick up in Matthew 21, verses 14 and 15, uh, this is where our story kind of comes to an end, so to speak, for today anyway. And it says, The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. It says, But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. So they didn't like it because he was giving glory to God and he was doing these amazing things and he was healing and he was teaching and they didn't like it. So they became indignant. In verses 16 and 17, we pick up with, Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, he, yes replied Jesus. It says, Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? And it says, and he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. So basically Jesus is doing these amazing things and he's still doing his father's work even though he knows what's about to happen. And he's healing people and he's teaching people right up until the very end. Jesus didn't just say, you know what, I know that I'm going to the cross in a couple of days so I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to relax. No, Jesus said, I still have my father's work to do, and I'm going to do it right up until the very end. And in this case, it's kind of twofold. He's helping people, and he's getting the attention of the Roman elite and the Roman soldiers. So, what do we get from this story? And these are our takeaways, and these are the things we're going to dig into just a little bit here before we wrap up. But we're going to talk about Jesus as the king. And the first point I want to bring out is that he's a different kind of king. And that is so important for us to understand. Because we don't always understand what a monarchy looks like, or what a king looks like, or what an emperor looks like. Because that's not how we operate here in the United States. We don't don't operate under a king or under a monarchy. But what, yet we're still somewhat fascinated with it because when the royal wedding happened a few years back, man, everybody stopped and watched it and it was on at like three o'clock in the morning and people didn't go to work that day because they were watching the royal wedding. Because there's something about royalty. There's something about this whole concept of a king and a queen and a prince and a princess and things like that that is so fascinating to us. We see it in movies, we see it in stories, we see it in fairy tales. There's something about it that just draws us to that. But do we truly understand what that looks like? I don't think that we do. But we have to understand how Jesus as a king was so much different. If Jesus was a king, he would have been coming into that city on a big white horse with all of his soldiers. And if he was really coming to take over Jerusalem, he would have come in as a king or as a conqueror. But he didn't. Because that's not what he came to do. And that's what a lot of the crowd thought he was coming to do. They thought, hey, he's finally coming to set his people free, to get them out of the hardship that they've been in under the Roman emperor, and things are going to be different because he's coming as a conqueror. Because they didn't get it. They didn't get that that's not what he was coming for. Jesus came to serve. He came because he loved people. He didn't come to conquer or to destroy. He came to love and to save. And it's so important that we see that difference. And we see it in the whole story. Because we see as he came in, his mode of transportation was different. He didn't come in as a conquering king. He came in as a loving savior who was doing what he had to do for us. And that's so important that we understand that Jesus as a king was Jesus as a savior, that Jesus was someone who loved us, who came to serve us, not to be a king. But you also have to remember that people had been being told since the days of the Old Testament that this king was going to come and establish his kingdom and everything was going to be different and everything was going to be changed. It's important that we understand that because when we see a little bit later on in this story, some of these same people that were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, are the same ones that later on will be shouting, crucify 
him because they didn't understand what he had truly come to do. And that's so important. The next one says our king knows exactly who he was and who he is. Jesus knew what he came to do, and he knew exactly who he was, and that was he is the son of the living God, and he knew exactly what had to happen. Now, if we had the time and we could go back and dig into this entire story, we know that even at one point, Jesus cries out to his God, hey, let this cup pass before me. Maybe we don't have to do this after all, but if we do, let your will be done. See, Jesus still knew his place, and he knew what he had to do. What we see is when we see kings, like true kings in kingdoms, what we see is one of two things. Either they've inherited that position because their father has passed, and they don't really know what they're doing, and they're, they actually are very insecure. And the way they go about that is by, by boasting their authority and things like that. Or you get the opposite end of the spectrum, and you get the arrogant, overbearing king. But see, Jesus knew who he was. Jesus knew what he came to do, and he came as a humble servant. So again, he's not that kind of king that the people had expected or that we may think of when we think of a king. Now, the third point is our king came with compassion for bodies and souls. Jesus came with compassion and love in his heart, and he spent his days on earth helping others. He healed people that most people wouldn't have gone anywhere near because of their diseases. He healed people that most people wouldn't even talk to because of their nationality or because of where they lived or because they were not what you expected, but he had compassion on those people. He had compassion. He didn't come as a king with an iron fist. He came with compassion to love and to help people. And we see that throughout his time on earth is that he healed people because he loved them and because he had compassion for them. And he cared. Why do you think Jesus preached to everybody who would listen? Because he wanted everyone to be saved. The Bible teaches us that Jesus wouldn't have anyone not make it to heaven. So he preached to everybody and he preached to those who needed it the most because he loved and he had compassion about our bodies, our physical bodies, because we know that because he healed folks and our spiritual needs because he taught us how to be the kinds of Christians that we need to be so that we can spend eternity in heaven. Lastly, our king came sounding a note of judgment. Yes, Jesus loves us, and yes, Jesus has compassion for us, but Jesus also set a plan of salvation into place that we are expected to follow. So yes, he loves us, and he loves us so much, but he also sets some expectations for us. He sets some expectations of the things that we need to do. On the Sermon on the Mount, he lays some of these things out on how Christians should act in order to see the kingdom of heaven. It's referred to as the Beatitudes. Blessed are they who... Blessed are they who, he's laying it out for us exactly how he would have us to act. And we know that the plan of salvation to hear, to believe, to understand, to repent, to be baptized, to live faithfully, he put these things into place because of his love for us. But we have a job to do as well. He did the hard part, right? He came down to earth, he lived as a man, he suffered, he died for us. But see, there's something that goes along with that, and that's the part that we have to do. See, it's not a one-sided thing. Like any relationship, it's a two-sided thing. Jesus has done his part, and he now sits on the right hand. But now it's time for us to do our part. 
And what we can learn from all of these things that we talked about today is the one person who should have acted like a triumphant king didn't act as a triumphant king. He acted as a humble servant who was compassionate, who loved us, and who wanted nothing but the best for us. And that's what we have to take away from this. So let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come together this morning to talk about uh, the amazing return that Jesus made into the city of Jerusalem that really put this plan in place for us that we see carried out throughout the Scripture. Heavenly Father, we knew this was a necessary step in the process of the death, burial, and resurrection. And Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you loved us enough to send your Son to die for our sins. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We, we thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for all that you bless us with. We ask you to be with the members of this family wherever they may be and help to keep them safe and help them to focus on you. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us enough to do the things that you've done for us. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So here's a question that I want to leave you with today. Your king is coming. And the question is, are you ready? Are you ready to meet Jesus face to face? Are you ready to meet our King and our Messiah face to face and be able to give an account for what we've done while we're here on earth? You know, we're in this, this, this time that we have right now where we have a lot of distractions have been taken out of our lives. We don't have sports. We can't go to the movies. We're supposed to be staying at home as much as we possibly can. What a great opportunity that we've been given to have all the distractions taken away, to focus on that relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. And maybe you're in a great place with your relationship and you're able to really just focus on the love that he has for you and the love that you have for him. Or maybe you're in a place where you've let thing, other things take the priority and you haven't spent as much time with Jesus and you haven't spent as much time in the Word as you should. What a great opportunity you have to make that right through prayer and through confession and through study. So the choice is yours. In just a moment, we are going to sing another song and then I'll be back with you here shortly to kind of wrap up our services and close us out in prayer. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I'll worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy Well, thank you so much, guys, for joining us on the live stream. Wherever you may be this morning, we are just thankful that you chose to spend your morning here with us. Again, don't forget, if you haven't already, uh, send in those pictures with the hashtag, and that way we can see you guys worshiping with your families at home. 
And also want to remind everybody to take advantage of our easy tithe system. If you haven't had a chance to go on and make your offering, we want to encourage you to do that. Even though the building is closed, the church unfortunately still has the same expenses that we would normally have. So we want to encourage you to do so with a cheerful heart. Also want to just invite you to keep an eye on your emails this week as we do have those special emails going out. So church family, I hope you guys are having a good week. I hope that you are staying safe out there and spending time with family. And I would like to take just a moment to close us out in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we still have this opportunity to come together to spend time worshiping you on Sunday mornings, even though we can't physically be together. Heavenly Father, just be with all of our church family throughout the country, wherever they may be, and help to keep them safe and help them to take advantage of this time to really spend some time either connecting or reconnecting with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything that you've done for us. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, we strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He.